end. And can everyone see that okay? Perfect, okay. So still exiting from hegemony, why the Biden administration can't rebuild uh, the American global order. So um, the takeaways of the book are pretty straightforward and, 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 and relatively simple. Um, number one, the era of post-Cold War US global dominance is over. There have been recurring debates about US uh, hegemony. We'll talk about some of those. Uh, later, whether hegemonic decline is cyc cyclical or terminal. In this case, it's terminal. Um, that the U.S. will still be a, a, an important power, uh, will be the most powerful actor in many uh, spheres for many years to come, but global dominance is over. Uh, the transformation of international order does not require hegemonic conflict. In other words, we have been uh, blind in, in American international relations because we have tended to conflate changes in international order with systemic war and hegemonic war, and especially the, the approach by Bob Gilpin um, and other people. So we do not require hegemonic conflict to see changes in international order. The pathways to transformation as we lay out in the book are, are varied. Um, and we lay out three distinct ones that I'll discuss today. One from above, uh, one from below, and one from within, um, so to speak. And these are going to continue independently of who the US president is. Now, you'll notice uh, on the cover, we have uh, <coughs> President Trump or former President Trump. Um, we, 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 we tried to push back actually against this cover and the marketing people were like, no, we know what we're doing. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll keep them there. Uh, but in some ways the, 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 the cover is misleading because what we argue in the book is that <coughs> Trump was certainly an accelerant of the unraveling of US hegemony, but he was not the cause. Um, you can't pin it on Trump, uh, that the kinds of dynamics underway have been going on really uh, since the early and mid 2000s. And that's what we wanted to lay out in the book. Um, yes, there are certain areas where Trump intervened and he magnified these processes, um, but he was certainly not um, the, the cause. So the flip side of this, uh, in his first really foreign policy speech, um, you know, President Biden said, then President-elect Biden, Biden said, I want the world to hear today, America's back. America is back. Diplomacy is back at the center of our foreign policy. And Biden's team includes very, you know, very seasoned, experienced professionals, both at the State Department, um, in the Pentagon, national, and in the National Security Service. Um, the question isn't one of intention or um, uh, you, you know, attitudes towards global leadership or global engagement. Uh, and certainly there are uh, uh, certain policies, symbolic policies uh, that Biden has already undertaken, rejoining WHO, the COVAX effort, um, you know, the Paris Treaty to combat climate change, a kind of a reassurance of allies. Um, yet at the same time, the processes continue to unfold. And, and I would argue in some ways are only accelerating in the background. So my own, just at the very beginning, bottom line is I don't believe he can, and I don't believe he will. And I think the question is how do we calibrate expectations um, with this very uh, high and lofty rhetoric? At the heart of our um, argument is our conception of international order. Um, international order is distinct from international power. When we talk about power, we talk about concepts like unipolarity, a one uh, power system, bipolarity, uh, multipolarity. Uh, but order is something on top and uh, distinct. Um, it is predicated on power, but it can't be reduced to it. We view order in two interrelated ways. Um, first is the architecture of an order. Um, these are the rules, the norms, the values that give the order legitimacy um, that states in the order adhere to or pretend that they adhere to, um, that they acknowledge um, institutions like sovereignty or uh, democracy or the respect for internet, certain international norms. These are part of uh, uh, that kind of constitutive architecture. And this is what we focus on 
usually when we talk about international order, someone like uh, Professor Eikenberry, who talks about the liberal international order and its dimensions, its principles, its values that it rests on. Um, but just as importantly, um, we think orders have our infrastructures too. And infrastructures are the practices, the relationships, the routine flows uh, upon which uh, the order is established and constantly maintained. These would include things like mill-to-mill -mill exercises or regularly scheduled uh, bilateral or regional diplomatic meetings. They would include different agencies of the hegemonic power um, um, meeting and liaising with their counterparts or the kinds of uh, informal behind the scene networks through which say Treasury and Wall Street uh, maintain their ties and relationships. In other words, uh, the infrastructure uh, uh, you know, helps give substance to what the order is in practices and routines. International institutions bridge both. Um, they embody norms and values and they are part of those kinds of um, uh, routines. So I wanna go back a little bit um, and kind of uh, give you an analogy of what the 1990s were, because that's gonna be the baseline for today's talk. And rather than talk about IR, I wanna take a, a, a detour into small town America, just indulge me just for a minute or two. Uh, 1990s uh, was famous now or infamous for the advent of, uh, this, of, uh, uh, of Walmart. Uh, Walmart came um, to every small town, medium town and large town uh, in the US and it just took over. Um, it decimated small businesses. Um, it took over uh, uh, all of the, uh, fulfilling all the consumption needs of, um, uh, of uh, residents there. But it didn't just stop there. Walmart also became a supermarket. People would go buy their food from Walmart. They'd buy their guns, in essence, their um, security from Walmart. Walmart even got into banking um, and credit unions. You could go to Walmart for your personal uh, loans and consumption needs. So Walmart was the only game in town and it provided you with all the goods that you could possibly need uh, in your daily life. Not only that, Walmart was everywhere in terms of its marketing, its campaigning. Um, it made sense to be with Walmart. Um, you didn't really sort of think about it. It was a no brainer. Um, not only that, Walmart also went out of its way to hire an entire group of what were known as Walmart greeters who would tell you how awesome Walmart was to welcome you to Walmart and the ways of Walmart, to welcome you to part of this community uh, and so forth. Now, of course, the analogy here I am making is to the US of the 1990s, when um, it's not just a function that the Soviet Union collapsed, it's that after the Soviet collapse in terms of international ordering, um, the US and its allies were the only game in town. Um, that is um, the so-called end of history, sort of posited by Francis Fukuyama, a liberal democracy, uh, was the only viable acceptable form of domestic political ordering inevitably um, that countries now were inevitably in transition from the post-communist sphere and that Europe had been reunited as symbolized uh, by uh, the Berlin Wall. But like Walmart, um, other things started to happen. Uh, you can think about how the growth of Amazon actually provided um, a distinct new outlet for those of us who wanted goods uh, that are cheaper and more convenient. Um, we can talk about um, the advent of uh, the internet providing alternative modes. Um, other people wanted nothing to do with Walmart anymore. Even if it was uh, larger, uh, supposedly more superior, they didn't like what Walmart stood for. Uh, they didn't like the disruptions uh, that it brought to their communities and they were normatively uh, predisposed to other places. So everything changes. And at some point, what seemed to be, according to then Secretary of State Madden Albright, uh, America the indispensable nation uh, that had a duty, an obligation to stand tall, to use force, to intervene, uh, to uphold the international system um, became unraveled. So what happened? Oh, sorry, maybe here just sort of 
to sort of uh, uh, point out, this is not the first time we've, we, we've been through this. And then I mentioned sort of in the 70s and the 80s, uh, we had uh, you know, similar debates about the rise and fall of great powers. Paul Kennedy's book uh, posited that all great powers eventually collapse as a result of um, military overextension and fiscal uh, instability, right? And that the two were correlated in order to fund wars overseas, you would spend yourself into debt, eventually undermining your hegemonic uh, power. And this is how the world looked in the 1980s. So things changed uh, very abruptly. Um, back, if you recall, in the 1980s, the, the prognosis was we would, if we didn't join Japan, we would soon be uh, in possible conflict with Japan um, because inevitably Japanese power um, was uh, going through. To understand what happened, we have to understand uh, the pillars of the US-led uh, international order. And we identify sort of three uh, fundamental tenets. One is in this area of um, uh, uh, liberal intergovernmentalism. In other words, multilateral architectures and organizations to make rules, monitor compliance, and provide goods. Um, the US didn't necessarily um, uh, you know, intimately control all of these, uh, but certainly US allies um, were at the head. So for instance, at the end of the day, the Asian Development Bank was not that different in its practices than the World Bank, um, even though say Japan was the country uh, that operated it, or the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uh, operated to very sort of similar principles. Um, but liberal governmentalism does not mean that all countries are equal within a multilateral form, uh, much like um, uh, Vincent Puyo's pecking orders. It just means that the hierarchies that are there are not officially acknowledged um, as a course of, of sort of normative justification. The second pillar was economic liberalism. And here in the 1990s, we saw a distinct change. Um, whereas the compromise of embedded liberalism during the Cold War had been premised upon certain capital controls, and of course, till 1973, a US dollar, uh, um, you know, a fixed rate of the dollar to gold, um, the 1990s saw um, the advent of free trade and unrestricted financial flows, the so-called Washington Consensus. Uh, in fact, conditionality, as we know from research, became stricter, became more adhered to. Countries with no other, other place to go had no choice um, unless you were strategically important like Russia, um, but to adhere to conditions. Otherwise you would be cut off uh, from international lending. And then finally, the primacy of political liberal governance, uh, the projection of democracy, um, the UN human rights system, um, the specification and increase in governmental obligations to protect rights, including um, the resurgence of transitional justice forum, places like Rwanda, Yugoslavia, um, the advent of responsibility to protect. So these three pillars of the American hegemonic system. Of course, US-led order does not equal American foreign policy. American foreign policy itself um, was mired in many times in the state of US exceptionalism, hypocrisy, and double standards. The US often didn't practice what it preached, but these are the terms and rules that it set. And the very fact that it could be accused of hypocrisy on its own terms meant that these were the types of standards um, it sought uh, from others anyway. So the 1990s um, is this unipolar moment. And what happens is that there is an assumption, especially amongst US policymakers and frankly, amongst IR scholars, I was in graduate school <laughs> during this era, that these three pillars would reinforce each other, right? That somehow more economic liberalism would reinforce political liberalism, would reinforce um, the uh, multilateral governance and intergovernmentalism. Instead, we started to get many different kinds of combinations and outcomes. 9-11 uh, and the global on terror promotes a widespread anti-constitutionalism. We start having real competing ideas to political liberalism, not only in the US and the global war on terror, but across the world where security and sovereignty start to become values. Um, the Iraq war emphasizes US revisionism, the US empire debate, the eschewing of multilateral institutions. And of course, the great financial crisis of 2008 delegitimizes the US model in economic liberalism and finance. All these are important markers, of course, in the story. But in terms of the base story, this is really a story about power transition, um, but we're putting some flesh on the bones of a power transition story. So in the end, Japan didn't grow and converge with the US in, um, in uh, the 1980s and 1990s. In the 1990s was the lost decade. 
for Japan. And the gap between the US and Japan became even bigger. Of course, we talked about Berlin Wall, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And as a result, that left the US as the last superpower. Now, of course, in total spending, um, the US made defense cuts in the 1990s, something that uh, President Bill Clinton was uh, soundly criticized for, also retrenchment from a more kind of global base structure. Nevertheless, um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, it just outspent everyone, um, the combined other uh, 10 powers regularly. And really, when we look at sort of shares of global GDP, um, when we compare the G7 to the BRICS, um, we see now the BRICS at the point, um, whereas they used to be a very small part of the world economy, now they have overtaken um, the G7 in terms of GDP per, uh, purchase power parity. So then what are the processes? Key to our argument is this idea that in international order, the hegemon um, ha controls what's known as a patronage monopoly, right? That if you need goods, any types of goods, economic development assistance, investment, political, election monitors to certify your election and tell you you are legitimate, uh, norms and values. Um, these come from the hegemon and its allies. A power transition disrupts this. Uh, we have emerging great powers um, who can provide patronage, maybe not all spheres, but maybe some can provide development assistance. Some can provide different norms and rules, um, especially within their own regions or spheres of influence. Think about Russia in the former Soviet space or Saudi Arabia in the Gulf, um, or possibly even a country like uh, Venezuela for a while in Latin America. This leads to supply side effects, right? Countries now have exit options. Uh, they can go elsewhere. They can shop around. They can go to Amazon or Target as opposed to just Walmart. And it also importantly has demand side effects. Um, with this knowledge now that there are exit options, regimes, um, have counter order movements that they can join and governments have interest in new bargains. They don't have to take what Walmart is offering, uh, not without probing what else can be offered. Uh, maybe certain governments want more of a particular good in the security sphere or economic sphere. Maybe they don't like these pesky conditions that have been imposed. They don't want human rights conditions in their trade agreements. They don't want the kind of um, stringent um, conditions in IMF conditionality packages. And they leverage the availability of exit options um, for alternatives. So this leads to some of the dynamics that we see. Weaker powers have increased leverage. Oops. There's general contestation of the order and a process of alternative order building. Now, this is significant in the sense that a lot of the discourse in the 1990s and the 2000s, when we talked about China, we talked about Russia, we used to think of order as a binary. Will China play by the rules? Will Russia play by the rules? Um, as if intentions and ordering could be sort of separated out. And really what we see in both cases is an attempt to gradually reshape and transform the rules, right? As well as create new institutions with distinct uh, rules and norms. So let's talk then about the three pathways involved here. Um, the first one we call exit uh, challenges from above. The rise of Russia and China is great power. So um, in the interest of time, I won't go into all the debates, people like Beckley and so forth who um, look at things like patents and great power indications and, and, and find that say China's rise has been greatly exaggerated or those who focus on soft power and say, who wants to be Chinese? Who wants to be Russian? Their negatives are almost as high as Trump's negative. And that's actually true when you look at something like the Pew survey of global um, public opinion attitudes in the fall. Trump is deeply unpopular, the most unpopular, um, but so is Putin, uh, so is she. Actually, she is shockingly unpopular. Um, but uh, that's really not where we think the importance is. Um, instead, these organizations are doing a number of things that are, or rather these powers are doing a number of things that directly target the pillars of liberal international order. 
First, Russia and China have challenged liberal norms and principles with counter norms, um, with sovereignty and stability, um, traditional values, notions of civilizational diversity, um, and that they've introduced these new norms in new regional organizations. Groups like the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the CSTO, the Eurasian Economic Union, 16 plus one, which is 17 plus one AAIB, um, Quadrilateral Coordination and Cooperation Mechanism, that's China, South Asia, and Central Asia. So all of these acronyms, maybe they do things, maybe or not. In the West, we tend to dismiss them. We say they are cheap talk shops. Well, what has the CSTO done? What has the SCO done? That's not the right way to, well, not the right way. It's not the way we would look at it. Um, what these are, are new organizations that are networking with one another. They are recategorizing our very understanding of regions um, and they are disrupting um, the, the, um, the space and the political roles of other competing um, regional organizations in their particular space. They are liberal in form, but not necessarily in substance or geopolitical orientation. And I think that's why we've missed them and their significance. At the same time, you also see China and Russia unilaterally uh, completing their own uh, kinds of ordering infrastructures. Um, Russia's intervention in Ukraine and Syria brings up a whole host of dynamics, including very close informal cooperation with Turkey. Actually, that's also the case with uh, the war in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, China's Belt and Road Initiative, of course, is not just investment in infrastructure, even though the Chinese claim that. It's an international ordering system. Right, it's a system that also includes, uh, you know, provisions uh, for investment. Has implications for debt and other displacement of multilateral lending. It's the introduction of Chinese technological standards and infrastructural standards. Um, it has many ordering dimensions to it. So then, this question, as I mentioned before, you know, the rules. What are the revisionist intentions? Um, Instead, what China and Russia have done is they've reshaped the rules and ecology by introducing competing orders. And if you just want to take sort of the example of Central Asia in the 1990s, 1990s, there wasn't a whole lot going on in Central Asia. Um, everyone was sending actors, Turkey included, Saudi Arabia included, Japan, the United States, the EU, and everyone was projecting on Central Asia what they wanted to project. Um, the international organizations involved were pretty sparse. There was the OSCE. Um, World Bank was there, the IMF was there in some countries, not all, um, and the EBRD was there for some projects. But really, there wasn't a whole lot of ordering that was going on. All these countries are members of the CIS, but the CIS really wasn't engaging in anything of substance at the moment. And that changes in the 2000s. It changes as a result of Vladimir Putin becoming president, becoming more interested in um, uh, the near abroad creating new regional organizations and security and economy to engage with the post-Soviet states. Um, and it also in, uh, changes in terms of um, countries like Russia wanting to change the nature and the substance of what groups like OSC are doing in the areas. Um, but even in areas like Europe, where uh, the, you had dense liberal ordering infrastructures, right? The EU, NATO, the expansion of 2004, which is legendary, you now have um, a much more contested and divided um, space than you did before. One of the points we make in the book is that if you map out um, with sort of, you know, some networking uh, analysis where all these new organizations are and who the member states are, um, you'll see that Central Asia and South Asia are uh, join more Chinese-led regional initiatives than any other area, right? So this is you know, essentially becoming China's neighborhood de facto. The purple dots at the bottom uh, shows you um, the percentage of new Chinese organizations that each country is a member of. So a country like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan is a member of a majority of these new uh, Chinese institutions. Here's some of them, SCO, AIB, BRICS, and so forth. Belt and Road I talked about. So what impact, what effects um, does this have? Well, some of them are subtle and some of them are interesting. Some of them are noteworthy, but sort of throughout this example, um, the inability of the EU to reach a consensus critical statement about human rights practices in China in 2017, as it's always done, statement was blocked by all countries, Greece. Um, the Greek foreign ministry said, 
that this was unconstructive criticism of China. And according to Amnesty International, it's the first time the EU has failed to make a statement at the rights body. Why? Because it's the same year as you see the major investment in the port of Piraeus um, um, that becomes a gateway and a hub for, uh, I see Dimitri sort of shaking, shaking his head, but the, uh, he can take me on on that one afterwards. Um, certainly, uh, Greece's relations uh, with China uh, uh, were uh, quite developed under um, the previous uh, under the previous government. But not only are we creating new forms of ordering, we are revisiting some of the purpose and norms um, in older forms of ordering. This is a map that we uh, we made from the book of um, the support and opposition to uh, the Xinjiang re-education camps at the UN Human Rights uh, uh, Committee, um, 2019. So in, uh, in green, you have 21 countries that criticize China for its human rights practices in Xinjiang and the re-education camps. And these are, the US is not there because it had with, withdrawn from the Human Rights Council. Um, and these are like the classic, like liberal order countries, right? It's Canada, it's Japan, it's Australia, it's New Zealand, it's Western Europe, the UK, and the Scandinavian countries, right? And a few weeks later, you have a counter letter of 37 countries that then has a second iteration a month later, where over 50 sign of countries that not only support China's practices in Xinjiang, they praise China for being a defender of um, the UN human rights system in general, right? Um, and Look at the geographic dispersion here. We're talking about obviously um, Russia, um, countries in Latin America, countries in Africa, um, in the Gulf um, and so forth. Serbia would be added to that list actually later in the second wave. So um, real connections and real transformations, I would say from Russia and China to these architectures um, of ordering. The second mechanism is exit from below. Um, asset substitution in small states. We mentioned that having alternatives gives leverage to weak states. And here is where the patronage monopoly starts to fade. If you want to look at it in terms of our kind of clumsy diagrams on the right, we use two examples of international goods. One is financial assistance. The other one is election observation. In the 1990s, as we talked about, IMF and the World Bank were pretty much the only game in town. If you're Egypt, if you're Ecuador, if you're Cambodia, if you're Djibouti, these quote unquote, small, weak states, you had to go there or um, you had to do something, you know, pretty drastic and unconventional um, if you were in financial difficulties. At the same time, um, the US vis-a-vis -vis the OSCE was the primary election observer, um, especially in places like Eurasia. So elections in Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Russia in the 1990s until 2003, it was the OSCE through the ODIR, Office of uh, uh, Democratic Initiatives and Human Rights, um, that proclaimed whether your elections were free and fair. Um, and in the 1990s, they proclaimed that none of these elections were free and fair. Uh, and that started to become really irritating um, to these countries. So what happened? Well, one, I we did have this emerging debate about rogue donors and China's rise. Moses Naim talked about this a little bit, also Venezuela. Um, the question of whether they wanted to undercut Western lending to us is moot. This isn't about intentions. It's rather the availability of new patrons that empowers these states to um, improve bargaining terms and reduce these regime externalities, the negative impacts on the regimes. Um, and um, these countries and others, Sri Lanka, Tajikistan, all demonstrate this dynamic cross-economic and security uh, assets. And the cumulative effect of this asset substitution is a gradual increase in this non-liberal ecology, if you want to use that chart as an ecological metaphor, and changes in the practice of asset providers. So let me give you some examples. Uh, this is a gentleman on the left, Kurmanbek Bakiev. He was uh, president of the Kyrgyz Republic, 2005-2010. This was then President Dmitry Medvedev. But Kiev was, uh, um, Kyrgyz Republic is a very small country, but um, was host to a U.S. military base um, that through which uh, at Manas in the capital of Bishkek, 
all U.S. personnel going in and out of Afghanistan uh, were going for. Um, the Russians had been uh, obsessed with trying to get Kyrgyzstan to close the space. And indeed, in February 2009, the last time we had um, um, a transition to a democratic president, um, the two of them announced that the base was no longer popular, that it would be closed. Oh, and by the way, Russia would provide a $2 billion emergency assistance relief package to Kyrgyzstan. Now, this sent officials in the U.S. into freakout mode, um, and Bakiev did what every good Central Asian bargainer does. He waited for the first payment of $300 million to hit his bank account and then turn around with the Americans, did a new deal. Instead of calling it a base, they called it the transit center, and he raised the rent from $17 million to $63 million a year. Um, so oh, by the, don't take my word for it. By the way, uh, uh, Bob Gates's memoir called him uh, without doubt the most corrupt politician he'd ever dealt with um, for, for what that's worth. Um, but we see this across many of the spheres in which the U.S. actually has had um, traditional hegemony in both security and economy. Uh, Mr. Duderte of the Philippines has famously or infamously been courting President Putin as well as President Xi has been uh, talking about canceling and revoking things like the visiting forces agreements um, in response to certain staff officials being denied visa entry to the US for human rights violations as part of their war on drugs. Um, this is an interesting slide because sometimes, you know, asset substitution is more perceived than real, yet nevertheless, it's important. RFERL conducted a survey in Serbia in 2019 towards the end of it, and they said, who gives the most aid to Serbia? And 40%, 40% of respondents thought it was China, right? Just 18% thought it was the European Union, 15% thought it was Russia. And of course, overwhelmingly, the European Union gives the most aid to Serbia, right, by 90%, but that wasn't the general perception. Why? Um, many reasons, part of it's the information space, part of it is that local politicians play up the importance of alternative emerging powers as donors and patrons like China and Russia, they project um, somehow sovereignty in being able to engage with them as opposed to just engage with the West. In some ways, I would interpret the Ukraine crisis as a battle between these two spheres. Um, and yet Viktor Yanukovych uh, turning on the EU, demanding increased bargain from Vladimir Putin to join the Eurasian Economic Union, which he receives in the form of subsidized energy and bond repurchases. And then we all know what, what, what happens after that. This wasn't just something out of nowhere. Um, this was about orienting to sort of two different distributors. I wouldn't call them uh, club goods, but maybe collective goods, um, you know, the EU versus Russia. Section in the book we call the phenomenon of the multipolar populace, right? Leaders, again, in places like Hungary, uh, Turkey, uh, Philippines, who traditionally been part of liberal international order, who are now very overtly hedging their bets, indicating that their own sovereign strength um, and the country's autonomy and independence comes from being able to deal um, with multiple powers. In fact, Orban, when we're talking about vaccine geopolitics, something that interests me, uh, made a public spectacle out of taking uh, the Chinese vaccine, even though it hasn't been um, approved. So this is what the messy ecology looks like in this sort of second mechanism. Gone is a world where the arrows are going in one clean direction. And this is my completely horrible, no good rendering of a very messy ecology. It's an ecology where the arrows go in both ways, where yes, IMF and World Bank deal with countries like Egypt and Ecuador and Cambodia, um, but their leverage in doing so is diminished by the availability of alternative patrons, countries like Saudi Arabia or China or new regional organizations like um, the AIB. Uh, same story in election monitoring. In fact, we've gone so far in the other direction. President Takayev of Kazakhstan, uh, after the elections last month that were criticized by the OSCE, say, OSCE is just one organization. Who cares what it thinks? All right? And in fact, he was right. There were over 40 international observers in the Kazakh elections, and the OSCE was the only one that had any complaints uh, with it. Um, but you see alternative monitors from places like the CEO or the CIS. Again, undercutting the authority and the influence of these traditional um, goods providers. Our final mechanism is the rise of contested transnationalism. This is what we call exit from within. 1990s and early 2000s, liberal transnationalism was dominant. 
This was a world of activists beyond borders. If you remember the, the Keck and Sick Inc. book, I don't know if this was taught almost sort of as gospel about um, the third sector that transnational networks were neither uh, belonging to the geopolitical sphere, neither to the private sector, and that activists forge networks with their principled counterparts overseas, that somehow they were cl more clever than governments, that they could boomerang around them, that they could usurp uh, their sovereignty. Um, liberal activists were the Walmart readers of the 1990s go around the world telling us how awesome liberal values were and how inevitable it was that you would uh, come around to them. Included also some other dimensions, networks of economic advisors, post-communist transitions, the Washington Continuous. I would include Juliet Johnson's brilliant book on networks of central bankers um, at this time too, in the post-communist world, um, as well as the spread of liberal uh, humanitarian norms. But a number of things happened in 2000, 2010s. Uh, one was um, the color rev revolutions, um, 2003, 2004, 2005, recast the role of NGOs. They are no longer just political nuances. Um, they are recast as actual security threats. After all, you see NGO and street involvement in a place like Ukraine or a place like Kyrgyzstan topple a government and they start being treated such as security services. We see a crackdown on NGOs in Eurasia. Some of them are kicked out. They're stigmatized, politicized. The so-called foreign agent law in 2012 um, in Russia gives way to the undesirable organization law in 2015, where they're just outright banned. At the same time, we see the brokering of new illiberal transnational movements. So one group, the World Congress of the Families, um, starts out as a group founded by two Christian right uh, groups in the States in the 1990s, and it networks with some Eurasian oligarchs. Um, foundations and capital um, to start creating a transnational movement that views itself as an illiberal counterpart um, to liberal values. And then you start seeing a systematic attempt by Russia especially to divide uh, opinion in countries of the West um, through quite low cost uh, interference operations, whether it's supporting uh, far right or far uh, left parties in Europe um, that oppose EU membership and NATO membership or the 2016 presidential targeting um, with the social media campaign of the um, Internet Research Agency. So kind of a very similar story graphically here. It used to be that liberal NGOs and transnationalism, the arrows flowed one way, um, that the US embodied these kinds of liberal values. These were imparted on NGOs and the NGOs would try and influence countries like in Ethiopia or Russia that they would provide the norms in organizations like the UN Human Rights Council um, or the OSCE um, in its sort of you know, predominantly liberal values. And then these would be imparted on countries like Hungary um, and Poland. Um, and now we see, uh, this was actually Orban uh, delivering the keynote at the World Congress of Families uh, when it was held in Budapest, uh, where he went on a screed against the tyrannies of liberal internationalism. I want to play just a clip here, um, if you sort of indulge me. And this is that this is one area where Trump actually was quite active, um, that for the first time you started seeing a president of the United States, and especially the White House, side with a lot of these counter order liberal mo mo movements, whether it was appointing ambassadors to countries like Germany or Hungary, um, or the Netherlands that openly sided um, with alt-right parties. And in fact, you know, Hoekstra in the Netherlands through a fundraiser for a Dutch sort of far-right paper to sort of Brunel in Germany kind of openly mocking uh, NATO and EU commitments. But I think one of the more astonishing things was the very uh, aggressive support for Brexit um, as well as the UK party. And this is Nigel Farage campaigning for Trump uh, over the summer in Arizona. And if you just indulge me for a minute and a half, what he has to say, I think is quite revealing. A friend of mine, a lot of people say one of the most powerful men in Europe, Nigel Farage. Oh, I'm non-controversial and shy compared to you. I gotta say four years ago, I was honored to come to America 
to bring the Brexit message, the message that you can beat the establishment. And that is what Donald Trump did. He beat the pollsters, he beat the media, he beat all the predictions. And here's the worst bit, they've never forgiven him for it. Four years of the Russia hoax. Four years of a false impeachment. Most human beings under that barrage would have given up. This is the single most resilient and bravest person I have ever met in my life. You are voting. You are voting for the only current leader in the free world who has got the guts to stand up and fight for the nation state, to fight for patriotism, to fight against globalism. You'll be voting for the only leader in the Western world with the real courage to stand up to the Chinese Communist Party. But a man who... A friend of mine... So, what was remarkable about the Trump White House was that you had um, a kind of a counter order movement within the executive branch of the US, essentially, right? That was sort of taking aim at these kinds of values um, and these types of sort of positions um, where they could oftentimes in, um, in, in contradiction um, with State Department policy or DOD policy in these same countries. Um, what does our messy ecological map of transnational look like? Looks a lot messier. And I would note one of the reasons why it's so messy is now you have real competing values within the US, the traditional values versus liberalism as it gets played out in the realm of foreign policy. But you have these types of contestations within the UN system, within the OSCE. You have Russia as an active sponsor now, um, blocking NGOs that come to it, but also through government organized uh, NGOs um, or uh, counter networks like the World Congress of Families uh, trying to influence outcomes on these counter norms. Um, and I would say of the book, this is probably the most controversial uh, uh, argument that we make. In essence, uh, there have been many different times in history where transnational movements have played a role. Uh, revisionist states in interwar year in Italy, uh, in Germany, they didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, they came out of uh, transnational counter movements um, that really seized the state in these particular locales. You can think about the effects of counter ordering movements in the form of decolonization movements. Um, all of it, yes, of course, superpower dynamics and competition uh, played a role in fueling them. But they actively networked from each other. They learned from each other. Um, they uh, uh, emulated each other's sort of strategies and tactics. That would be another one. And then, of course, Dan has written a book on the collapse of dynastic empires and how that was fueled uh, by the Reformation uh, and, and, and counter ordering uh, there. So we actually don't think this is exceptional in world history. But again, because we've been so focused on war as the main mechanism of international ordering change, uh, we miss these change. We miss these changes. One other argument that uh, we make in the book that these 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 dynamics now tend to reinforce each other and they're 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 accelerating the process of unraveling and this power transition. Um, the undermining of patronage monopoly creates more exit options. Um, that um, new ideological mo movements and models uh, strengthen counter ordering movements. Um, which then leads to more political instability and disruption, um, all feeding this power transition process. If you recall how quickly things unraveled between, say, 1989 and 1992, um, I think in similar ways, um, the, uh, certainly I would say the last three years of the Trump era had that kind of feel to us. So the bottom line, this is my last slide. So. Yes, Biden can slow or mitigate the changes Trump has accelerated, uh, but the three mechanisms identified predate him, they're gonna endure after his administration. There's really no strategy to stop these. I'll give you an example. Um, Biden has to make a choice about whether to support liberal political parties in allies like Europe. And either way, uh, the choices are gonna have consequences. Traditionally, the position has been neutral, right? We don't care. Um, whether it's the center right or center left that has power in a place like Italy or Germany 
or the Netherlands. Um, um, but now um, we've seen sort of, you know, what happens when Trump chooses sides. I think you'll see a more active support for those countries that value the transatlantic alliance. But by doing that, you're also injecting yourself in domestic politics in the way that's gonna remain contested. In other words, the untouchable spheres of foreign and security policy that, uh, that were the pillar of this core uh, liberal international order are now gonna be part of routine contestation. Uh, I also think, while well, I, from bio, I, I, I support anti-corruption work. Um, they've been quite heavily touting anti-corruption um, as a new kind of strategic priority, elevating it uh, to the role of national security policy. Uh, I think this is gonna backfire. I think you're going to see accusations by leaders uh, who have been um, gone after with extraterritorial rules, talk about unwanted interference, just the way they did with democracy. But in any case, the problem with liberal values now is that they're just so heterogeneous. They encompass democracy, human rights, anti-corruption, LGBT rights, you know, all causes that I support. But the problem is in many other countries, uh, opposition politicians can just pick the one that's the most unpopular in their society and go with that and use that as a political pinata against why liberal ordering is inappropriate for their particular country. The ecology of the international order, as I've sort of shown, is more dense, it's more contested. Um, so some might, some of these pathways might be mitigated, um, but they're all going to be transformative. And, you know, the question is, are we in fact heading to a world, and I think we'll have some more answers by the summer, where we have the rhetoric of liberal uh, hegemony, uh, but none of the substance. Thanks so much. Really uh, look forward to your uh, comments and questions and criticisms. Great. Um, I will kindly ask all of the attendants um, to raise their hand using the raise hand function in Zoom. And then I will just take their questions. And uh, do you want us to take a couple of questions at the same time, or do you want to take uh, one question? Sure. However you want to do it is fine by me. Let's get as much participation as we can. All right. Well, I have, we already have uh, quite a few hands. Um, so I will go with Burahan and then Sechkin. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kuli. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, fun to watch that uh, and see the, how you are creating these three different areas of transformation, the exit uh, areas. Uh, I would like to ask you about um, what sort of architectural change should we be expecting with this current transformation? And uh, I'm, I'm not talking about the infrastructure terms. Uh, I'm not saying that if some new players become dominant and uh, previous players go out, but uh, should we expect some way that how relations are stru structured, how financial flows are structured, how, uh, let's say, maybe a regional leader being chosen as titled regional leader type of uh, sovereignty relations? Uh, should we expect something like that in this transformation or maybe as its result, or should we consider it just players changing and that's it. And the game is still similar uh, in the international system. Thank you. Great, thank you. Should, 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 should I take this one and then we'll... How about we have Sechkin as well? Okay, great. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so two, two very quick questions. Uh, uh, Fantastic talk, Alex, thank you so much. Um, so the first question is, um, how much of this do you think is recognized in Washington DC at the State Department and various government institutions who are in charge of you know, guiding, shaping and implementing US foreign policy and grand strategy? So this, my second question is, um, so what do you expect from the Biden administration in terms of a new strategy towards the post-Soviet space? I think I asked the same question to you two years ago uh, uh, in New York, but of course, a lot has changed since then. So do you expect a new uh, strategy towards the region uh, or will it continue uh, on the same path uh, as Trump administration? Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. And those are those are great questions. So let me start with the so what, what concrete changes in the architecture. Um, 
whatever changes there are and they're underway, they're not going to be universal, right? We're not going to have the thing that opposes liberal internationalism. Instead, we're going to have a mix of different norms that are projected at the regional level. I think you already see it and you have some clues in places like, say, the New Development Bank um, or uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that uh, uh, you know, give lip service to liberal lending norms, but their actual practices are, are, are quite different. Um, in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you have a clear statement of um, what they call the democratization of international relations, which is code for um, displacing the US, a multipolar world. Uh, the Russians prefer to use the word polycentric world that acknowledges hierarchies and polycentrism. It's not just sort of equal multipolarism that you get to have your sphere of interest. Um, but I also think uh, on the other side, principles like good neighborliness, right? Um, that is one community of like-minded nations. Um, you know, that's something that you're going to see uh, attempts at uh, consensus, um, political stability. These are all kinds of the norms of the architecture, kind of status quo oriented ones. Um, I think this question, this, this point is really excellent about regional leaders, right? I think the bet from kind of advocates of liberal international ordering was of course we would get to a point where US power was fading, but then we would have kind of countries in their regions, each in their own flavor, take up this mantra of leadership, say Brazil and Latin America, South Africa and Africa. Um, and in their sort of style, they would uphold these pillars of the order. Instead, you see very different behavior, uh, in part because when you're leading a regional organization, um, you don't want to be so quick as to impose someone else's values and norms and exclude a member state. Um, there's a real sort of complicated nature to regional politics. Um, and so what you've seen is instead kind of a greater um, tolerance, right, for sort of pushback on liberal ordering, all in the name of sort of um, fostering regional solidarity um, and appropriating, in fact, um, you know, some of that authority at the regional sphere uh, that used to be at the international sphere. So that's the way I would read it. I think the transformation is already upon us, but these liberal norms are actually, again, quite, you know, quite different and quite uh, heterogeneous. Also, the norm of, of security is, is very big to sort of justify a lot of this. So um, cooperation between internal security services in places like the Gulf Cooperation uh, uh, Council or uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and so forth. Um, Sefkin's questions. So how much does this recognize? It's recognized some in the State Department. It's not recognized at all in the Department of Defense. Um, some people incoming in the NSC get it. Some have plans. I think where I differ with some of them is that even if you come up with very forward looking governance principles for new domains like cyber um, or climate change, um, or international information flows, um, what's the guarantee that you're gonna have liberal outcomes? In fact, I would say in a kind of a global world, if you look say global media outlets with the rise of RT and CCTV, um, the information space um, is, is, is less favorable to the US than it's ever been, right? So it's not clear to me that advocating for principles of openness and open world really will give you that. Um, in fact, if anything, it might accelerate in the other direction. As far as the post-Soviet space, I think it's important to acknowledge Biden himself would not be president if it wasn't for the Georgia war. Just very, <laughs> um, you know, as a matter of fact, um, he was the pick over Tim Kaine in August of 2008, where they, while the Georgia war was raging, they wanted to reassure voters, uh, especially given sort of McCain's hawkishness on Russia with an experienced a foreign policy pro. So Biden has very strong views on Georgia, has very strong views on Ukraine. Um, Georgia is very tricky right now, given what it's doing. I do think Russia is not um, a priority, and that's probably a good thing, right? We're not going to have a high profile reset. There's no plans for one. There's no appetite. I think that's a good thing. So that expectations can't plummet again. I do think the sanctions are going to continue. I think they're going to try and be clearer about what steps um, Russia has to take the de-sanctions, um, but you know the Kremlin isn't going to you know, stand for this. They're going to retaliate in their own way, especially against the Navalny sanctions. So it's more of the same. Fortunately, the geopolitical stakes aren't as high. So what we saw in places like Kyrgyzstan, Belarus, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, a lack of U.S. involvement actually diffused the geopolitical implications a little bit, right? And 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 I actually think that's a good thing. 
um, so that not every street protest is associated being for or against the West. Um, you know, nevertheless, you know, it is an open question, you know, what's, what's the US involvement going to be in, say, the Minsk group or, um, you know, the future of the caucuses or what role is it going to play in Georgia? The big wild card for me is Ukraine, right? The big wild card is what happens if Russia escalates support to uh, separatists in the Donbass, what is going to be the position? Are we going to increase military assistance? Are we going to um, green light completely um, use of weapons like the javelins? Um, how hard of a line are we going to take? I, you know that 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 could get messy and thorny. So to me, that's that's the biggest unknown. But what I have found is still this kind of dismissal of Russia that oh, Russia is a regional power, Russia is a declining power, <laughs> you know, which which also doesn't make any sense in terms of basing your sort of strategy on. Um, but Biden himself is quite interested in this region. I wouldn't say he's consumed or obsessed with it. And, and that's probably a good thing. Fantastic. So I have Professor Dmitry uh, Tsarukas and then Professor Tudor Onya. Yes, great. Thanks, Elisa. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Alex. Uh, two brief questions, and then I'll, I'll tell you why I was uh, responding whilst you mentioned the Greece example. Um, the first is <clears throat> on transatlantic relations, because there's been a lot made out of it in terms of uh, Biden's investment in it. His uh, personal career spanning so many decades has been very much into building the alliance with Europe. I wonder if you think that this sort of talk about the community democracy, legal democracies can create within a context of competitive regionalism that you so nicely elaborated upon, uh, strengthen the hand of the West vis-a-vis -vis, uh, emerging emerging um, challenges. And, and that, of course, um, as you very nicely said, will bring with, you know, its own set of challenges uh, along the way. And I think the best example in my mind right now uh, is India, of course. Uh, on the one hand, praise of the world's largest democracy. On the other, what's happening inside the country is quite frightening. So I, I wonder what your take on this would be with a particular reference to transatlantic relations. And secondly, very briefly, maybe <clears throat> to try and take a bit of an op optimist note here, because you, you started and rightly so, defining hegemony along the lines of international public goods. And I wonder, particularly in a post-pandemic world, is there going to be anything other than climate change that can potentially bring the world together? And I think here, the Biden administration, working with the Chinese who have made massive inroads in investing in renewables, could be you know, one of those corrective features that may amend some of the calculations we're currently make. Finally, very briefly on Greece, I owe you that. Uh, you know, the Greeks were really pissed off with the European Union and who can blame them. And when they opened up the port of Piraeus, they said, okay, we want the Germans to buy it, we want the French to buy it. You know, we want the Americans to buy it. Who came along? Well, the Chinese did. So there you go, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. Um... You know, I think I think you, you put your, your your finger exactly on on what I see the the, the problem in this um, you know kind of uh, uh, you know resurrection of this group of democracies or alliance for democracies or community you know whatever whatever the term is. Uh, not only India, you include Brazil, right? You you know give uh, Bolsonaro that platform. Um, you exclude the polls on what basis? It gets to be very tricky. And this is where I get sort of there's a distinction now between democracy and liberal values and liberal ordering in these places. Yes, India is the world's greatest democracy, but you know, it's actively doing what it's doing, also legitimizing the sort of revocation of citizenship, right? Surely that's not a principle that's gonna be abided to. So what could all these countries agree on? It's not clear. Um, and so I'm I'm pretty pessimistic on this. I I I think it has the potential to really backfire and to have the storyline being, you know, what's, you know, you know what, you know what divides these places, as well as not being able to reach, um, you know, any kind of sort of meaningful consensus. Um, so I think there's a danger there. Um, you know, the, the the transatlantic issue is is real and it's difficult. I think we need to think of this across multiple dimensions, right? So one is. I think there is room there for convergence and a deepening um, in areas like regulation, even areas like anti-corruption, um, um, you know, IP, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the routinization 
uh, of, of, of US EU links, you know, certainly can be, uh, can be deepened. On the other hand, what you've seen now with the Chinese investment treaty is the reality of Europe, um, that um, Europe wants some sort of autonomy and it makes sense. It makes sense to have an independent Chinese policy. It makes sense to hedge. Um, yes, 5G seems to be going the US's way, um, but that's just this battle. And you know there are many other <laughs> kind of technological standards um, that are gonna, uh, gonna appear on the horizon and, 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 and the US isn't gonna be able to sort of uh, cajole and get its way. More importantly, I think the mechanisms through which the US has pressured countries, I think, you know, kind of scratches the surface and gets rid of this kind of benign transatlantic power kind of idea that it has, right? That there's, you know, Trump opened the way to this, but you'll see this sort of in Biden too, sort of the linking of the economic and the security sphere is only gonna call for increased sort of strategic autonomy. Um, I would even venture, I mean, sort of imagine a world sort of 10 years where the US is becoming so obsessed with the transatlantic relationship, it's trying to keep everyone in line, right? On all these sort of foreign policy priorities, that would be a disaster, right? That would be like the mirror of <laughs> kind of Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. So uh, it's, 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 it's really interesting, but again, it, it can't be reimagined in the same way. And, um, and I think the, the, the question of how much how much autonomy can you live with? Can you grant and be clear about that? That's the reassurance that they need uh, that they need to give because not everything can be 5G. Not everything can be elevated to that you know, importance of sort of snapping your fingers and expecting everyone to fall in the line. Right. And Professor Ornell? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very, very much for a very interesting talk. I have two points that I would like to, to raise. Um, and please feel free to address either one of them. Um, the first one is, does it really matter if you're not only, if you're no longer the, the only game in town, if you're still the biggest game in town? Because after all, we are and this comparison with the 1990s, right? It sounds to me like, you know, in the 1970s, everyone was thinking the United States is on its way out because it's no longer pulling the economic figures that it did in the 1950s. Uh, but in the long run, it really did not matter, right? And nowadays, I mean, you could say, well, there are a lot of other institutions and other alternatives to the United States, but who is actually going to favor them? Uh, and I know you mentioned the Pew polls. The one that I would like to raise is the one in 2018 where countries chose who would they like as a world leader. And 63% chose the United States and only 19% said China. I, I probably think that if Saudi Arabia was on the ballot, everyone would have voted for that. <laughs> but it's, it's still, this is, this, is, this is a concern. Does it matter? The second one, the sec my second question has to do with uh, how exactly do you come with the conclusion that war or the danger of war is not going to be on the cards? Because this looks terribly to me like Modelsky long cycle. And so we are in a delegitimation phase, right? Where the rules, the institutions are being contested, but then the good stuff comes, right? Which would be the concentration, loss of power and ultimately as he puts it, world war. Probably not that, but at least a rivalry of the type of the Cold War shouldn't necessarily be excluded at this point. And if you have arguments against that, I would like to hear them. Uh, thank you. I think those are both excellent points. And, um, you know, certainly I think, that, you know, this question of sort of, you know, is it cyclical or is, is it terminal? I think anytime you say, you know, this time it's for real, probably. <laughs> We think, <laughs> um, and then that's why we, we tried to base sort of like the analytical basis for the judgment. And this is sort of ecological metaphor. It's not that the U.S. won't be uh, the most powerful actor. It's just that its advantages in both military hegemony and dollar hegemony aren't going to translate to control of the ordering apparatus in the way it did. I think that's the argument. And um, and Dan and I have a foreign affairs piece, a new foreign affairs piece coming out in a couple of weeks that talks about the illiberal world order. And the fact that it's already upon us. We're, we're just accustomed to thinking of these infrastructures and, and architectures as being liberal, but they're not anymore. Not in character, not in purpose, not in substance. Um, but I absolutely agree with you. There is the potential for the pendulum to swing back a little bit. Um, but I think what we'll have is 
as, as you mentioned, the 1990s was exceptional, and yet we base so many of our expectations in the US, and frankly, in American-centric international relations scholarship on them too. Um, when in fact, the normal pattern has been one of contestation, transnational contestation, interstate contestation, um, ordering contestation, that's the normal realm of things. Um, and in fact, for the, really the vast majority of world history, world order has been illiberal, um, whether it's been you know, colonial, legitimized by racial hierarchies or uh, dynastic empires, you know, whatever you want to sort of pick and choose, the organizing principles uh, have been different. And then that's what we'll revert to. But, but for sure, the US can play an outsized role. It just, it, it has to get used to contestation and it has to get used to losing, right? And I think one of the fundamental choices it has to make is every sign of interest by China and Russia a threat to US priorities, right? Is every sort of engagement in Tajikistan or Ecuador something that's like strategically indispensable? Um, and I don't think the US has a good uh, answer for that. In terms of danger war, um, you're absolutely right. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. I, I think our point was that, you know, is there a cart before the horse mechanism here that um, the, sorry about that, um, that the, uh, 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 that it's in fact um, transformations in the order that have preceded conflict and not the other way around, in which case I might be sort of inclined to agree with you in the potential dangers out there. Um, it might be the case in 20 years time, if we do have some sort of major power conflict, when we look back at the Georgia war, right, as the first in the kind of post-liberal world, right, or we view, um, you know, what happened, in, you know, in the Taiwan Straits as, as something that, that, you know, that is part of it. So let's hope we don't get there. Um, but I think our main point is that you don't require the mechanism of war for international ordering change. Um, but it may well be that it is um, a leading indicator. Let, let, let's hope it's not. Um, but but I, I can't reject that possibility of your point. Yeah. Fantastic. Professor Shaheen? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kohli, for such a fascinating talk. It was a pleasure to attend. Um, it might be too early to, uh, to comment on the effects of the pandemic, but I just can't help asking your opinion on, um, on the effects of it. Like, How do you see the effects of the pandemic on the US ability to maintain its current position and the ability of the you know, contestant powers to counterbalance or resist the US hegemony. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. It's, it's a topic of great interest for me. I would say very briefly, there are kind of three potential mechanisms that come out of the pandemic. One is perceptions of global leadership in which the US initially from its denial of the pandemic and its withdrawal from the WHO, its refusal to join the COVAX, um, left the door open um, to China um, and it's sort of picking up the funding of WHO. Now that's reversed with the re-engagement of that. So I think that's, that's, you know, that's something that can alter. Um, the second one is having the authority to manage the crisis. And again, there, I think things are changing. US handled the crisis abysmally. The deaths that we had just even here in New York in March and April, um, you saw real disruptions in the sort of federal system, states and localities not being on the same page as federal government. But here's my prediction. I think, unfortunately, because we have had 500,000 deaths here, which is just like astounding. And I don't want to get in a philosophical discussion about how we've devalued human life. It's, it's, it's clear that we have here in the States and that's, that's really disturbing. Um, but I also think memories are short. And I think the new metric for competence now is vaccinations. And here it's an opposite world than where we were in the summer. It's a world where <laughs> the Israelis have vaccinated everyone um, UAE is not far behind. It's a world where the UK is ahead and the US is doing pretty well and the EU is nowhere. Um, and so I think this vaccine metric is going to become the new metric for competence. The final mechanism is one that relates more to today's talk is this question of medical goods and collective goods. The Chinese really tried this in March and April. They had these very high visible attempts to bring goods to Italy, advisors, especially after they had been spurred, spurred by uh, the EU, other parts of the world too. In many places, it, uh, it, 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 it played well, but in many places, it also backfired. Um, the goods were exposed as being sort of shoddy. Um, it didn't really change the mind of politicians. The politicians that were with China sort of touted Chinese help. The others who weren't 
sort of were suspicious, right? And, and, and so I, I'm not sure it moved the needle. The big race right now is vaccines and geopolitical vaccines. I don't think that the vaccine issue is going to be as big as some people make it out to be because if you are a government, you have to hedge. You have to be multipolar, right? It's just, it's, it's ill practice to lock yourself up in any one contract. Look what the EU is dealing with in terms of AstraZeneca. You have to try and get as many vaccines from as many suppliers. Um, so, you know, you, you know um, vaccine politics from the demand side has to be multivectoral politics. Um, because if you don't do that, you're in trouble. So I think the Russians here, just my own opinion, we had an event on this yesterday at Harriman, you know, they made it, they made a mistake in politicizing this so much. Um, there was no reason to, they had a vaccine that was gonna be perfectly adequate and safe, it could have been part of this. Um, and now they've drawn so much attention to it um, that it's become a really a heavily politicized issue. Um, and with more suppliers coming online, um, places like the EU are just gonna dig in and get jabs from sort of other suppliers. Now there's no need to do it, I guess. But again, this played into the Russian notions of prestige and, and influence and, and, and getting us out of, out of where we are. Um, so I think overall the pandemic has, has, has magnified some of these issues, some of these problems. But what I see in the pandemic is that the, boy, these, these things change really quickly um, and these perceptions change really quickly. And so I'm not, quite ready to narrate the definitive kind of how did the pandemic uh, change IR. Uh, not quite yet, let's, let's revisit it over the summer anyway. Great, uh, Ali, Arslan. Um, can you, do you hear me well? Okay, um, well, um, I want to first uh, thank for this great uh, talk today. Uh, as an undergraduate student, I'm very interested uh, on uh, change of order, global order. And my question is on uh, the effects of this transformation or transformation of order on uh, war, but uh, not on war between great powers, uh, war between uh, smaller powers initiated by smaller powers and uh, violence in initiated by uh, violent non-state actors. I mean, if a transformation of uh, order happens, then of course, not only the states will have uh, alternative uh, sources of funds, uh, violent non-state actors would have this uh, same uh, expanded opportunity set as well. So would this transformation of order uh, bring increased uh, international terrorism? This is one question. And mm. um, the increased the potential of rise of authoritarianism with uh, funds, uh, would this cause uh, increased interstate war between uh, small powers because we have this democratic peace theory and it would be uh, upside down when uh, leaders can gain funds and use it to uh, strengthen their regime. So yes, uh, yeah, well, this is the question and the effects of transformation on smaller powers. Thanks so much for the question. It's a great question. I, I don't have a very good answer to it. I haven't, I haven't thought about it as systematically as you have. I think there's something there to probe, certainly. I think I would um, take apart a little bit the question of sort of terrorism versus small power or non-major war. I think there are probably distinctions here. I think, in fact, you know, coming back from, from our discussion of the pandemic, I think the kind of monitoring extraterritorial capabilities now of states are so great that um, I don't see any reason why terrorism itself will increase as a result. I think the capacity of security services has actually never been greater than it is now, both in terms of sort of technology and, and networks um, overseas. So I would caution that, but I do think there's something to your point about the possibility of conflicts um, um, being filled by um, smaller and medium range powers. I mean, you know, I, I think of a case like Libya for example, and everything that's going on there. Um, Central African Republic, um, you know, this has been also an area of real priority sort of for the Russians where they see gaps or vacuums in security governance. They go in with these kind of quasi or non-state actors like Wagner Group or sort of, you know, offering social media assistance and, and so forth. So, um, you know, I think it's a possibility. I think we'll, we'll have to take stock of it in a few years when we can. Um, but I can definitely see a compelling logic um, for what you're talking about too. Uh, I will also say, I think, um, 
you know, in terms of the U.S. taking the lead in a lot of these places, um, you know, there's not going to be a lot of appetite for that in the American public. I think that's that's you know across left and right the talk of sort of perpetual wars you know there is there's there's a real reluctance to do that so even i'm trying to imagine even when obama deployed uh troops to cope with the outbreak of ebola you know could biden do that even post pandemic with the norms it would be just awfully difficult for him politically um so yes uh power vacuums and regional powers filling vacuums um libya yemen um, Syria, of course. Yeah, absolutely. There might be something there. Excellent. Uh, and John, uh, thank you for your patience. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Professor Cooley. Uh, it's great to have here. It was really a great talk. Uh, my question is basically uh, from a strategic point of view. Um, how would or how should the Biden administration respond to the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, um, is there a clear viable strategy um, appearing uh, on the horizon? I mean, in the literature, some argue that uh, the US should involve and try to shape China's vision uh, from within. Some argue that uh, it must um, openly challenge and somehow delegitimize. Or, uh, as I read from uh, one of your uh, op-eds, uh, should the Biden administration play uh, a role game and avoid exhaust exhausting its diplomatic energy and resources uh, for a while and wait for China to uh, fail in these infrastructure projects in uh, much of Eurasia supercontinent? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, it's a great question and one I don't have, I think, a very good answer to. I think the strategy has to be, has to be and is um, with many different vectors. One is, um, you know, there, for the first time in, in what you saw in the Trump White House with the Africa strategy was a real change in tone about Chinese infrastructure and investment, right? The sort of trying to delegitimize it, talking about sort of the corrupt deals and predatory nature of it. That's in stark opposition to the Obama era. In the Obama era, the war in Eurasia was connectivity. And if the Chinese were providing connectivity, great. We're all for that, which I frankly always thought was a very naive understanding of infrastructure to begin with. Infrastructure has always been politicized. It's always used for certain purposes. Whether it works out that way is a different story. Um, I do think um, a strategy of empowering certain allies in certain regions to sort of counter, right? So supporting sort of Japan's efforts and its sort of attempts to bring kind of, you know, quality infrastructure. Um, that should be one prong of this. Um, uh, in certain key states that are strategic allies, uh, you will have to compete with China. You might have to outbid with China, but you can't do that in every case. And that was the point of the op-ed. So for instance, this sort of, you know, taking over Chinese debt in Ecuador to me is just lunacy. Like, like why? Because Ecuador doesn't adopt 5G, we're gonna sort of pay off. You know, Ecuador defaulted on its international bond obligations, right? Then the Chinese moved in with an energy for loan uh, deal. Now we're taking that over. It sends a signal that all countries have to do is sort of invoke the Chinese and we'll be there um, to, to sort of, you know, uh, pick this up. Um, I do think that rope-a-dope has certain advantages. Um, there are demonstration effects for how China treats certain countries. Um, for the internal dynamics that are spawned. No one wants to be um, primarily under Chinese influence. You want China to be one of many powers that you're dealing with. You want to be empowered by China in these bargaining dynamics, but you don't want to be um, completely in debt and owned by China. Um, so this gets back to the point that the US, you know, it has to pick some priority and priority countries, and then it has to accept the fate that you just can't control everything and it's okay to lose. Um, and that it has to have confidence in itself that what it's offering to states that are willing and want it, who have experienced other goods providers, either because of the quality of the goods or the networks that it provides access with, um, you know, that there will be a demand for it. Um, but I think just this, this kind of instinctive, oh my God, Russia's in Sudan, like we have to pick off Sudan. Or you know, you know, the Chinese have a base in Tajikistan. Like we have to pick this off. It's just whack-a-mole. It's going from small state to small state, 
And I don't think it's good strategy. Right. Fantastic. We actually are running very quickly out of time, but we have two um, hands still. So would you mind if I ask you, Sevden? Yeah, let's take them both. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Sevden, I could please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Cooley, for the presentation. So uh, I just want to ask about your like explanation and whether like it's it's like a deterministic or like systemic in the sense that uh, when you mentioned these like three pillars, it's actually I mean because we talked about whether there's an uncertainty, whether there's going to be a decline in hegemony, but the explanation that you provide actually gives us uh, the sense that there is no surprise in here whatsoever because. The three pillars that you mentioned already carries its own like doom, like so to speak, because the liberal you're talking about like financial financial liberty, like the liberal order, actually gives out to for the way to rise for others. So when we talk about asset substitution or uh, the transnational networks, I mean, is it really something like so surprising? And then if you're looking at it from a deterministic perspective, if I'm understanding or whether I'm reading too much into it. Um, like, can we can we say that then the leaders or whether there is a rise in China or Russia has nothing to do with it, but the system itself is already is going to come to an end, like almost like, I don't know if it fits, but what Paul Kennedy suggests uh, of uh, the greed maybe of the nations, I don't know. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, I'm Sir Cooley. Thank you for the presentation um, talk. Uh, my question will be: uh, Do you think if the Chinese uh, AIIB uh, will be, uh, will be enough to create its own sphere of influence together with uh, its Belt and Road Initiative? Because most of the scholars uh, talk about the project as a, a debt uh, trap. Uh, if you consider, for example, uh, Sri Lanka, it couldn't pay its debt, and China just uh, got the uh, port for uh, for 99 years. And do you think if um, this ch uh, Chinese influence uh, in power transition might benefit uh, the small powers? For example, if you consider uh, Central Latin American countries, uh, they, um, they did not recognize Taiwan as a um, country and China um, um, gave them financial aid. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for both of those. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with you that it's not surprising. I think, though, I, I would just go back to this idea that um, perhaps a lot of people in positions of power and influence have been blind to the changes that have already occurred, right? And so I think what we're trying to do is shed light on those. But yes, many of these mechanisms absolutely have these internal contradictions and the hollowing out of the states and its own economic base is one of them, as my sort of friend and colleague, Mark Blythe from Brown University says, jobs to China, profits to the Cayman Islands, right? Um, you know, this is what liberal ordering has done, in essence, on, 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 you know, on, on mediated, unfiltered liberal ordering, to the economic base um, in the US. Um, so of course, there are gonna be sort of political repercussions and fallout. Um, but, you know, I, so, uh, I had an experience where, where the incoming ambassador to an international organization I went, I briefed him on the state of things. And I have to say, this is a good person, very smart, intelligent, well-read, very stuck in the 1990s, right? And couldn't believe that you had fake election monitors or that you know countries wouldn't condemn China's sort of you know abuses in Xinjiang and so forth. So um, I think you know our 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 views haven't really caught up with the reality that that you are talking about. And maybe that's what should be surprising. Um, you know, regarding China, I, I absolutely think that this can be a boon for small states and in particular rulers of small states who demand this mix of private goods in addition to sort of collective goods. Um, I do think that there is a, a, a demonstration effect that's gonna happen as to how China renegotiates its debt, what kind of pressure uh, does it apply and that states are gonna be you know, looking at this. I think what China fears is the possibility of collaboration amongst stutter states, um, that they will coordinate their responses and come up with some common tactics and principles. So I think there's sort of an incentive there to keep them um, divided, <laughs> right? Not be able to <laughs> launch a collective kind of anti-Chinese debt initiative uh, and so forth. And so I think that'll also necessitate continued domestic involvement in politics, um, the way that the Chinese say they don't, I think inevitably they will. Um, and have to. Um, 
But again, the name of the game, if you're a small state, is not being locked in. You want autonomy. You don't want to be a client for any one country, whether it's the US, whether it's China, whether it's Russia. And getting that balance is very difficult, um, depending on geography. Um, so, so, so that I see as a main uh, uh, as a main challenge. But you're absolutely right about the appeal to small states of the Chinese model and the No Questions Act, and also the opacity of some of the deals. And that's why it'll you know continue to be you know quite tempting um, for them. Thank you very much, Professor Cooley, for answering all of these questions and for giving us a sense for some very important global dynamics um, happening before our eyes. We are immensely privileged and we are very grateful to you for accepting our invitation. And we would like to extend our most profuse thanks um, for joining us today and for um, giving us this really wonderful presentation. I'd also like to thank all of um, our colleagues and, and students who came and, and engaged with your presentation. This was a fantastic session. And we really hope to host you here in person, not to not too long from now. Uh, it would be a real, it would be a real privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you for organizing this, for all the adjustments that you made, for your very thoughtful uh, questions and participation. It's been, it's been a real, um, a real honor for me. Thank you. Well, I think we're going to use reactions with uh, digital content more than anything, just for yeah. uh, difficulty of coordination. But uh, stay safe and healthy, and we really hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. And you Thank too. you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.